Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 4. Revelation, chapter number 4. The title of the message is just one word this morning. It's the word soon. Soon. You hear me make reference quite often in my messages to the rapture. I think the rapture is the next major event on God's calendar of events. But seldom do I spend much time talking about what takes place beyond the rapture. There's reasons for that. One of the reasons is whenever I do that, I typically spend a long time, not just one message, but a series of messages, talking about what will take place after the rapture. And the reason I do that so often is because it's so connected, it's hard just to say one or two things and break free. However, this morning, maybe tonight, but at least this morning, I would like to preach and just give you a quick survey of some of the major things that will take place after the rapture of the church. So I hope you'll keep your Bible open. We'll actually read more Bible verses than I typically read on any church service, but especially on a Sunday morning. I will give you a disclaimer as we start. Bible prophecy is not like simple terms written on stone tablets, such as the Ten Commandments. It's always written in symbolic language, and it's scattered throughout the entire Bible, which makes it very difficult to know if what you're reading, understanding, assuming, interpreting is actually correct. To be truthful, when it comes to prophecy, I don't believe anybody can know absolutely for certain that what they believe is correct until it's about to happen, or maybe even until it is happening. For that reason, there's a lot of good people that will disagree with what I say this morning. That doesn't necessarily make them bad people. It just makes them good people that disagree with what I'm going to say this morning. However, because of that, I would encourage you to read and study the Bible for yourself. You need to read not just Bible prophecy, but the whole book. You need to make sure that what I preach, what I teach is actually what you believe, what you read when you read the verses of the Word of God. Case in point, the nation of Israel. Nation of Israel did not miss Jesus because they did not know their Bible. They did. The religious leaders, they knew their Bible. But they had a different understanding of the Scriptures than what they actually were. They did not believe when Jesus showed up that He was who they were looking for. They did not believe that what He did was what they thought the Messiah was going to do. And they did not think that what happened was what was supposed to happen to the Messiah. They had biblical reasons for what they believed, but they were so focused on what they believed, they could not see the truth manifesting itself right in front of them. And so I'm going to preach to you this morning what I believe. I, if I didn't believe it, I'd change what I believe. But I do believe it. However, you need to read and study the Bible for yourself. This morning, the title of the message is soon. Three thoughts, if I get to all three of them. Number one, would you notice the rapture is symbolized. The rapture is symbolized. Revelation chapter 4, start reading at verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. These two verses, I believe, symbolize the rapture in the book of the Revelation. You'll notice several truths are given to us about the rapture from this symbol of John being taken up into heaven. We learn what the rapture is, we learn how the rapture works, and we even learn when the rapture will take place all from these two verses. Notice some things about what the rapture is. Notice, first of all, John was called into heaven. That's what the rapture is. It's the calling of God's people from this earth to that place. Notice, secondly, John was called to heaven suddenly with no warning. That's what the rapture is. No warning, no foreknowledge. He heard the voice of God, and the voice of God called him in the presence of God. Notice, third, he was called 
into God's presence so that he could partake of the things of heaven. From that point on, John could see what was taking place in heaven. John could hear what was taking place in heaven. John could experience some of what was going on in heaven. Now, all of that is what the rapture is. It's God's means of taking us from off of this planet into the presence of God so that we can experience the things that are taking place in heaven. John had a disadvantage. John's not going to get to stay forever. At that point, John's being temporarily invited up into heaven so that he can write this book. He'll have to leave heaven and go back down to this earthly plane. You and I won't. When we hear that sound, we'll be permanently moved to that place called heaven. Not only do we see what the rapture is, but we also see how the rapture works. Some of it I've already alluded to. John heard the voice of God. God summoned him into his presence. I believe we will hear the voice of Jesus. Much like Lazarus heard it when he, was when he was laying inside that tomb, Lazarus come forth, I believe we'll hear the voice of God. I believe, as he says in this verse, that it'll be accompanied by the sound of a trumpet. Paul talks about that over the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and on into chapter 5. How at the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. All of this is telling us how the rapture will take place. Would you also notice he left, John left his flesh behind. The Bible says immediately he was in the spirit. That's how the rapture will take place. If that trumpet sounds, if that voice calls, in this very instant it could happen, you and I, the fleshly part of us, will be left behind and will immediately be in the Spirit to be caught up with the Lord forever. Bible symbolically is telling us what the rapture is. And it's telling us how the rapture will occur. But perhaps even more importantly, it's telling us when the rapture will occur. Now, John doesn't actually start talking about the tribulation until chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse number 1, through the last verse of chapter number 19, John is writing and describing what we call the tribulation on this earth. If you'll notice, we're at Revelation chapter number 4. Now, I'm not great at math. My wife tells me all the time, you don't need to do math in the pulpit anymore. But I think, I think 4 comes before 6. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say the rapture happens before the tribulation. John is telling us when the rapture takes place. Now, there's a lot of disagreement about that even among Bible believers today. Some don't believe. They believe the rapture will take place, but they don't believe it will take place before the tribulation. Some think in the middle of the tribulation. Some think after the tribulation. But I don't think John was wrong where he put this symbolic rapture at. He's telling us where, when, and how the rapture will take place. If you need more information to convince you of that, there's plenty more. All the books of the Bible talk about this. No, not all. Many of the books of the Bible talk about this. But let me just give you a couple of other truths to help cement this when in your mind. The Greek word for church in the Bible is the word ekklesia. Ecclesia means to be called out. It, the Greek word, is used 19 times in the book of Revelation. The English word church, if you get a concordance, is not. You'd have to look up the Greek word ecclesia, but you'll find out it's used 19 times in the book of Revelation. 18 of those times is in chapters 1, 2, and 3. 18 of the 19 times God makes reference to the ecclesia, the church, is in chapters 1, 2, and 3. All of those three chapters are before chapter 4. The last time the word ecclesia would be used in the book of Revelation is in the book of Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16, after John has talked about the tribulation. From chapter 6 through chapter 19, those chapters where he's talking about the tribulation, he doesn't mention the church a single solitary time. Even though in the first three chapters he mentioned it 18 times, he doesn't mention it at all once he starts to talk 
about the tribulation, he won't mention it again till the tribulation is over. And when he mentions it in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16, guess where it's at? It's not on the earth. It's in heaven. What does John talk about between chapter 6 and 19? He talks about the nation of Israel and he talks about the world. Why does he talk about the nation of Israel and about the world? Because the tribulation is for the nation of Israel and it's for this world. He doesn't talk about the church because the church isn't here. The church goes out at Revelation chapter number four. But then again, you don't have to have theology to come to the right conclusion on this. Just good sound reasoning will help you to do it. Throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. Typically, people only marry those that they love. So I'm assuming by that that Jesus loves his bride. What groom would allow his bride to go through a wrath that his own father is pouring down upon them? What groom who says he loves his bride would allow his bride to endure the wrath of his own father. I can only say the only kind of groom that would do that would be a weak groom or would be a unloving groom. And might I tell you, neither one of those is Jesus Christ. He loves his bride. He's not weak. I have a notion he's not going to let his bride go through the tribulation. But then again, the Bible talks about that bride again. Book of Reve excuse me, the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 27. Paul talks about the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. And he says, Christ will present his bride, his body to himself. And he describes it with three terms. He says, without spot, without wrinkle, and without blemish. Might I just tell you, if the bride of Jesus Christ goes through the tribulation... It will have far more than spots and wrinkles and blemishes in it because the whole point of the tribulation is to bruise, to batter, to break, and to cause bleeding. The bride that Jesus will present to himself, if he lets it go through the tribulation, will be a broken, bruised, bleeding bride. I'm just telling you, there's plenty of reasons in the Bible that we ought to be able to rest securely in knowing the church goes out before the tribulation. One goes back to Revelation chapter 3, verse number 10. One of the last things that, that Jesus told his bride, he made the promise, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. My friend, if you don't think the tribulation is a temptation, you just don't know what the Bible says. The truth of the matter is, the Bible is teaching us symbolically here what the rapture is, how the rapture will take place, and even when the rapture will take place. But, but having said all that, your problem and my problem is not when we get into God's presence. Our problem is we're going into God's presence. Whether you're saved or lost, you've got a much bigger problem than when that meeting takes place the very fact that meeting is going to take place is in itself a problem. Sinners standing before the presence of a holy God, that's bad situation. Now, when you see Jesus, when you see God, when you're summoned into his presence, you will meet him in one of three conditions. You'll either meet him saved and right with God, or you'll meet him saved and not right with God, or you'll meet him lost. Those are the only three conditions that there are. If you meet him saved, right with God, all well and good. You've done the best you could to use your life for the honor and glory of God. You're going to receive rewards from his presence. You're going to receive his commendations. He will be well pleased with you. If you're saved but not right with God, you're still going to meet him. But things aren't going to be quite as good. You still got heaven. Don't worry about that. The Bible doesn't talk about us losing our salvation. But you, you, if you're not living for Jesus, when you meet him, called into his presence, you will have regret. Now, I'll be honest, I don't quite understand this. I know heaven's heaven, and I don't care whether you did anything for Jesus your entire life or not, heaven's good. 
But I also know that there is this thing called the judgment seat of Christ, where we stand before God and we have to give an account for what we've done in this flesh, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Talking to Christians now, we have to stand before God, give an account whether we have done good or evil in this flesh. And I got news for you. If you've been saved, you've been born again, but you haven't lived for God, you're going to have some regrets on that day. How long you'll carry those regrets in heaven, I don't know. I don't know. Bible does say after the judgments, God wipes away tears. I'm not sure he's just talking about tears of those who had to bid their loved ones goodbye. It may well be there's going to be some tears in the eyes of God's children who wasted and squandered their life. Truth is, if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to do what you want to do from that point forward. You're supposed to be doing what God wants you to do. So there's three conditions that we'll meet God in. Saved, all's good. Saved, but not right with God. It's still heaven, but there's going to be some regrets. Lost. Friend, when you meet God and you're lost, it don't matter if, if the rapture has occurred or, or if it hasn't occurred. You're standing before God lost. Regret does not begin to describe what you're going to feel. Regret does not even begin to comprehend what you're going to feel and what you will feel for all eternity. So even though I'm preaching about the rapture, we're going to spend the rest of this morning talking about what happens after the rapture. Problem today is not rapture. Problem today and the blessing today is not even the rapture. The, the problem, the blessing is we're going to stand in the presence of God. You better make double dog sure that you're ready to stand in the presence of God Almighty. Whether God sends his son to fetch his bride home, or whether God sends the death angel to fetch you home, really academic. It's only a matter of how we get into his presence. The truth is, we need to be prepared to be in his presence, and that can only happen through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Would you notice, number one, the rapture is symbolized. Flip over to chapter number six, and notice there, that the war is summarized. The war is summarized. Now, even we good, independent Baptist preachers say things wrong sometimes. Sometimes in our ignorance we say things wrong. Sometimes we just try to make things too simple and it comes out wrong. Lots of times we say something like this. The rapture of the church will start the seven years of tribulation. That's not true. The rapture of the church is not what starts the tribulation. And most people that say that, if they're good Bible students, they know that. What starts the tribulation is not the rapture of the church. It's the signing of the treaty between Israel and the Antichrist. It's described in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, just part of a verse is all I'm going to read. Daniel, chapter number 9, verse number 27 says, And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Don't have the time this morning to even begin to talk about all that's implied there. But that one week is not a week of days, it's a week of years. And he's describing, Daniel is prophesying the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. Doesn't begin when the church is removed. It begins when the treaty is signed. Now, if you'll notice real careful in your Bible, book of Revelation, there's a gap between Revelation chapter 4, verse number 2, and Revelation chapter 6, verse number 1. Chapter 4, verse number 2 is when the rapture took place. Chapter 6, verse number 1 is when the tribulation starts. John fills that gap by describing the things that he sees in heaven. However, there's probably a real, literal gap taking place on earth as well. While the Antichrist gets things ready for the treaty to be signed. You see, it's very likely that the Antichrist is already alive on this world and doing very well right now, today. If the rapture occurs today, the Antichrist is already here. Because after the rapture occurs, virtually we've only got seven years left and everything's done. Which means whenever the rapture occurs, the Antichrist is already alive and well. 
Not only is he already alive and well, if the rapture is imminent, he's also probably already in a position of power so that he can make this treaty. However, there's a problem. God has limited his ability to manifest himself until the church and the Holy Spirit inside the church are removed. Listen to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. There the word letteth doesn't mean to allow. O King James language, it means to hold back. Only he that is holding back will hold back until he is removed out of the way. Well, who's holding back the Antichrist? If he's on the earth now, when the rapture occurs, regardless of whether it's now or a thousand years, who's going to be holding him back? The Holy Spirit is going to hold him back. By what means? By the means of the church. He's indwelling the believers. We are the body of Christ on this planet. We are the church. The Holy Spirit in the church is holding back the Antichrist. He can't begin to do what his master wants him to do. The Antichrist cannot do what his master wants him to do until the Holy Spirit and the church are taken off of this planet. So it might take him a little while to get this treaty before Israel so that it can be signed. I don't mean a long little while. It may take him a few days. It may take him a few weeks. It may even take him a few months. It won't take him an exceptionally long period of time, but he will spend some time putting together this treaty. And when that treaty is signed, then the seven years of tribulation begins. It is the covenant that is signed. Now, you don't have to sign a treaty because of a war. People make alliance, alliances and sign treaties all the time without war. However, war is a good time and a good reason to sign a treaty and the Bible summarizes a war in Revelation chapter 6. Pick up at verse number 1. Verse 1 says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword." Now, he goes on to describe, to summarize this war in additional detail. For example, read on down through verses 6 through 8. I won't take the time, but you'll find out this war either engulfs one-fourth of the world's population or it slays one-fourth of the world's population. The more I've studied it, the less I'm sure of which it would be. But regardless of whether one-fourth of the world's population is involved in it, or whether one-fourth of the world's population is killed, we're talking about a world war. He's summarizing here a world war. Now, there's two things you need to understand. I need to understand. We need to understand. Number one, we need to understand that the rapture is not based on what happens to or in the church. The rapture is not based on what happens to the church or takes place in the church. God's calendar is not based on the church. God's calendar is based on Israel. Now, that doesn't mean that what's taking place in Israel, the mechanisms that are forcing Israel into certain positions, it doesn't mean that it's not also affecting the church because it more than likely is. 
Both are supposedly God's people. When people develop a hardness to the word of God so that they don't respect God's people, that same hardness is going to cause them not to respect the church. When people begin to, to want to go against the God of Israel and the preaching, the teaching that the Bible has given in the Old Testament for Israel, you can rest assured they're going to want to go against the Bible's teaching and preaching that he gave in the New Testament, which would affect the church. So whatever is taking place in Israel will more than likely have some effect on the church, but God doesn't base his calendar of events on what happens to the church. He bases his calendar of events on what happens over the nation of Israel. If you want to find out when the rapture is going to happen, don't look at the church, look at Israel. I don't know what's going to cause God to, to tell his son, get up and go. I don't know. But one, one thing could be a gigantic war could take place. Second thing you need to understand. This event that causes the rapture will not take place in a vacuum. There will be external forces that will force Israel into positions so that the rapture will occur. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. Let me see if I can explain what I'm trying to say. God won't arbitrarily pick a time, I don't think, and send the rapture. I think what will determine the time of the rapture is the nation of Israel, but it's what people are doing to the nation of Israel and it's what's going on inside the nation of Israel because of what people are doing to the nation of Israel. You may be aware of it, you may not. A massive policy change took place in the United States of America this last Thursday and Friday. On Thursday, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer made the statement public statement, read it to the news, that he believed Israel had lost its way and that Israel needs to hold new elections and to have a new prime minister put into office. The very next day, which was Friday the 15th, President Biden commended Schumer's statements and supported them, which tells me Schumer was just Biden's puppet. It was Biden that wanted that statement made. But he knew as the president of the United States, he has no business interfering in another nation's internal matters. And so he had him say it. And within 24 hours, he just comes out and says, yeah, he's right. Could I just point out to you that the United States of America has no authority and no reason to tell one nation that it should not support and defend its own citizens. As of this moment, Hamas, the Taliban, whoever it is that holds those Israeli hostages still has them. They are still threatening to kill them. As far as I know, they've probably still got some American hostages in there as well. It shouldn't just be that America's telling them to get out. America ought to be getting in. If somebody's got one of our hostages, America ought to be going after them. Amen. But what President Biden did through Schumer he just emboldened the armies that are fighting, the armies, that's the terrorists, that are fighting the nation of Israel to do more. I'm telling you, the events that will call the, cause the rapture, that could cause the war, that will hasten the rapture, are not occurring in a vacuum they're happening because of the things that are being done to and inside of the nation of Israel. And what Mr. Biden just did on Friday has probably hastened the coming of the Son of God for us. But this isn't the first time Mr. Biden's policies have done that. August 2021, rather abruptly and with no preparation it would appear, he pulled America out of Afghanistan. After America had been engaged in the Afghani war for 19 years and 10 months. 
I don't know if this figure ever dawned on you, but that makes the Afghan war the longest war America ever fought. The second longest was the Vietnam War, 19 years, five months. When he pulled our troops out, CNN, in an article released April the 27th, 2022, said he left behind an estimated $7 billion worth of weapons and technology. $7 billion reported by the most liberal and leftist news organization in the world would tell me he left a lot more than $7 billion. There's no telling how many billions of weapons, technology, and cash. All that money we've been funneling, funneling, funneling over there for the last 19 years and 10 months, it got left too. How much money and cash we left. CNN in that article made the statement that some of the weapons were powerful weapons. Some of the weapons were high-tech weapons. Some of the weapons were transport vehicles, and some of the weapons were what I would call uh, soldier weapons, guns, pistols, and ammunition for them all. NBC, which is also one of the most liberal and left-leaning news agencies, in an article dated January 2023, says those weapons now have been cropping up all across the world in various Taliban conflicts. The one that article was about was Kishmer, Kishma, get over in India, the uh, capital of India, uh, was that particular war. But throughout the entire world, the Taliban has been funneling those instruments for the purpose of military attacks. You're probably like me. You probably don't like it when Americans are on somebody else's soil. I don't like the fact that Americans were giving their lives for fighting for the Afghanis and for fighting for those particular reasons, that whatever they were, that we fought for. But I do know this. I do know that we had one of the strongest military mights in a region that's completely surrounded by Islam religion, Islam extremists, jihadists, uh, uh, Taliban, all of these different terrorist groups. And when we snatched them out, we pulled out the last defense to hold those evil nations in place. While we were in Afghan, Afghanistan, we were only 1,800 miles from the borders of, issue, uh, of Israel, which means had something like this happened while we were there, our planes could have been in the air and could have been taking care of that matter within a matter of a few minutes. And now those borders are completely unprotected. And I dare say that it's our cash and our weapons and our technology that they're using to attack the nation of Israel right now. Which means, more than likely, we didn't just embolden them when we left that way. We probably paid these terrorists for this attack, and we probably gave them the weapons that they're using on this very attack. I'm simply trying to share with you this prophecy of the rapture it's related to Israel's calendar, what happens in Israel, but it's not happening in a vacuum. What's being done by other nations to Israel and with Israel is probably hastening the return of Jesus Christ for the body of believers because we are contributing to what could be the war that will be the event that a treaty needs to be signed for. But it don't stop there. America has actually, since October the 7th, 2023, been very generous, which surprised me to no end. Knowing that Biden is a liberal, I don't know if he's a leftist. I know he's a liberal. But it has surprised me much that he has publicly and financially encouraged America to support the nation of Israel until recently. As of recently, the last few weeks, last few months, he has threatened to veto any more funding for the nation of Israel unless it is tied to funding for Ukraine. 
now let me say, I don't understand Ukraine. I, there's, I, I'm no expert in anything, uh, nothing, but especially military endeavors in foreign countries that I really know little or anything about. But I will tell you this. The fact that the Democrats are for it, I'm sorry, but that automatically makes me lean towards being against it. The Democrats in our nation have a proven history of supporting liberal and leftist agenda. You do not see them supporting capitalism, America, or righteousness, virtually any at all, which makes me question whether we ought to be helping Ukraine at all or not. But even if both of them are as pure as the new driven snow, to refuse to help one unless we help the other just simply condemns them both to purgatory. To refuse to help one unless we help both just condemns them both to be overrun by their military enemies. The policies that America is implementing are helping to embolden the enemies of Israel to attack the nation of Israel. And the Bible is summarizing a world war in Revelation chapter number 6, and you can mark it down. If God is telling us about it in the book of Revelation, it's because it has something to do with the nation of Israel, and it has something to do with this world. It may not happen before the tribulation, but it could. It may not happen when the rapture takes place, but it could. It may not happen until after the rapture takes place, but somewhere around that immediate time, there's going to be a world war, and that might be why Daniel in chapter number 7 says, the Antichrist signs a covenant with the nation of Israel for a period of seven. Let me say one more thing, and then I'll get off of this. I know... I think this way sometimes myself. I know many Christians, even inside this room, think we should not help other nations, even the nation of Israel, as long as we've got homeless folks and vets and others that aren't being properly provided for in this country. Lots of things I need to say about that. I can't because I don't have the time. But that's that leftist liberal agenda that hates America that doesn't want to help those kind of folks. However, you and I need to understand every, every dime, every nickel and every penny that we give to the nation of Israel, especially to support its existence, is a direct investment in the United States of America. It is a direct investment in the United States of America. You say, preacher, how come? Because Genesis chapter 13, God promised to bless those that bless Israel. And God promised to curse those that curse Israel. And friend, if you're ever going to send a penny, nickel, dime, dollar, any place, if you send it to Israel, especially for its existence, to support its right to exist, you are sending money. No, you're sending God's blessings back to the United States of America in an exponential way. To be absolutely honest, America doesn't have a good track record right now of doing anything God wants. When it comes to standing for righteousness, for the Word of God, the things that are right, pretty much America's batting zero out of a thousand. It may be that the only reason God has let the United States of America stand at this very hour is because of the money and the means that we have sent to the nation of Israel to protect itself. And should this nation stop financially and materially with, with, with weapons supporting the nation of Israel, we might remove the very last reason God has for sustaining this country. And the end result might be he might let her fall whether the rapture occurs or not. I'm simply going to remind you what the Bible says. He'll bless those that bless Israel He'll curse those that curse Israel. If there's any place you ought to send a dime to, it ought to be the nation of Israel that it might sustain itself. You'll get the blessings of God when you do so. Number, would you, number one, would you notice what happens after the rapture? Number one, you see the rapture symbolized. Number two, you see the war summarized. Number three, and I'll hasten, 
you see the unholy trinity characterize. The unholy trinity characterize. Look over at chapter number 13. Now, I'm different from a lot of folks, even a lot of Bible-believing fundamentalists. I believe that the book of Revelation is written in chronological order. Most do not. Uh, brother, well, I won't mention his name, but a brother I had in our church, in our pulpit just a year or two ago, he, he emphasized that quite a bit while he was here, that he said the key to understanding the book of Revelation is to get in it in the right order. Then he rearranged the order. I don't believe the book of Revelation is out of order. I believe it's perfectly fine the way it's written. And I believe chapter 13 is either occurring right before the, the middle of the tribulation, during the middle of the tribulation, or slightly after the middle of the tribulation. And by that time, all three of the members of the unholy trinity are being manifested. The first one is called the beast. We call him the Antichrist. Pick up reading verse number 1, Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. In his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast. They worshiped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And Pyra was given unto him to continue forty-two months." Forty-two months is three and a half years. I think that means at the middle of the tribulation, this beast, the Antichrist, will attain the height, the zenith of his power, and he will have that authority for the rest of the tribulation. Now, I don't have the time to prove to you who the beast is, but you ought to be able to tell from reading those verses, he had a deadly wound. He should have died, but he didn't. He had a miraculous healing. That's as close to mimicking what happened to Jesus Christ as the devil can get. He can't raise the dead, so he's doing the best that he can. This beast is the Antichrist. He gets his power from the dragon. Told us twice in those verses. The dragon is the devil. As the, the beast, the Antichrist, is the copy of the Christ. So the dragon, the devil, is the imitation of God the Father. Now, you can read who the dragon is. He tells us twice in this book. Once in Revelation, I believe it's chapter, chapter number 10, verse number 22. And again in Revelation, I think it's chapter number 19. He tells us that the dragon, the red dragon is Lucifer, Satan, the devil. So we're not guessing who he is. We've got two members of a unholy trinity. Have you ever noticed how... The devil likes to copy the things of God. God's got a church, so he has his churches. God's got a, a religion, Christianity, so the devil's got his religions, and all the rest are part of his. God is a trinity, so the devil wants to be a trinity. He will raise up the Antichrist. That will represent Jesus Christ. The devil will be the Father. Well, we've got to have a Holy Spirit. Look down verse number 11. The second beast that rises is the, the imitation of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he talks like Jesus, but he is empowered by the devil. All right? That's what he's telling us. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the false beast whose deadly wound was healed. Do you know what the purpose of the Holy Ghost is during this age of grace? Cause the world to worship Jesus Christ. Well, what's going to be the purpose of this second beast, this fake Holy Ghost? He's going to cause the world to want to worship the false Christ, the Antichrist. Now, as the devil is limited, he's not God, he's not omniscient. He can't, he can't adequately fulfill the role of God the Father. As the Antichrist can't adequately fulfill the role of Jesus Christ, he can't die and be resurrected. So the Holy Ghost 
cannot adequately fulfill, excuse me, the second beast cannot fulfill adequately the role of the Holy Ghost. He needs help. However, we have created the technology today that will help him. Look down at verse number 14. And the second beast, that's who we're talking about, the second beast deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwelt on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. An object will be constructed and it will be given a form of life. Well, the devil can't give real life. Only God can do that. But he can give artificial life to this image. He can give artificial intelligence to this beast. The Holy Spirit knows everything. He sees all things. How will this unholy trinity accomplish that? Man, there's cameras all over this world today. Somebody told me that the average American is seen on camera some 500 times every day. Now, he must not be talking about Green Pond because there's days when I don't ever leave the house, okay? Uh, but, but I guess he is talking about the big cities, five four or five, six hundred times every day. When they tie all that in together and use artificial intelligence, they will be able to see literally everything and know virtually what everyone is doing. So by the middle of the tribulation, the unholy trinity will be in place. The unholy trinity has a purpose. Let me give it to you quick and I'll shut up. They have a purpose. You see it through these chapters. The first purpose is that the Antichrist might rule over the entire world. A one world leader. The devil has always wanted to have this whole world under its thumb. This will be their political agenda to put the whole world under the thumb of the Antichrist. And of course, the dragon, the devil, is calling the shots for the Antichrist so they're under his thumb. Number two, his objective is to have the whole world worship him. Now you see both of these things taking place in that chapter. Look at verse 6 again. And he, the Antichrist, opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Pick back up verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Who? The Antichrist. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What's his goal? One world government, one world worship of him. Now he'll, he will create, he will do three things to help fulfill that purpose. One world leader, one world worship of that leader. He'll create three things, do three things to help aid in that purpose. Number one, he'll create a one world government. Number two, he will create a one world economy. Number three, he will create a one world military force. Again, you see it in these verses. Pick back up verse number seven. And it was given unto him to make war. How do you make war without an army? It was given unto him. How does the Antichrist get to call that shot? One world government, one world army. Look down verse number 15. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast. How does one stop anybody from buying and selling without that particular mark? Only one way, a one world economy. So he will create a one world government, a one world economy, and a one world army to what end? So that 
there'll be a one world ruler and so that the whole world will worship the one world ruler. This is what happens after the rapture of the church. A war at, slightly before, during, I'm not sure, but a war. Antichrist will be revealed right off the cuff. He will cause the treaty to be signed. His power will continue to amass to the middle of the tribulation. He will seize full power at that time. The unholy trinity will help him to accomplish that. They will accomplish that. By that time, they will have in place a one world government, a one world ruler, a one world army, and, and all of this will be leading for the worship of that one individual. Somebody says this world's out of control. It's not out of control. God's in control. Somebody says this world is falling apart. It's not falling apart. It's falling into place. God is causing these things to happen. He's causing them to happen as a result of what happens to and in the nation of Israel. You say, well, what in the world can we do about this? You can do three things. Number one, you can be saved. The more people get saved, the less people the devil's ruling over. The more resistance we can implement and the less power he's got to implement his will. Man, just getting saved slows down the devil. Number two, you can pray. Prayer won't change the calendar of God, but it can push the events back. It can change the hearts of men so that these events are further delayed. Number one, you can get saved. Number two, you can pray. Number three, you can win others. The more you share Jesus Christ with others, the less the devil's army is and the more the army of God is. If there's any hope to stop what's about to take place, I, taught, I called the title message soon, but the truth of the matter is it's now. It's now. Every political decision that's being made in Washington right now, literally every single one is designed to create globalism, climate control, pandemics, which came out of laboratories, which probably weren't leaked. They were probably brought out. And it, all of these things, all of these things, man created, man exaggerated, Man implementing all of these things are moving us towards a place where our economy will fall, where our nation will fall, where the world will fall, where there will have to be a new world order. Whether you call it a reset, whether you call it a, a new world order, it, it, it doesn't matter what the name is. It's globalism. It's all being pushed that way. Not tomorrow. It's happening tonight. Now, what can I do? Get saved. Pray. Lead others to Christ. You won't do those three things. You can do nothing because the events that are taking place around us will produce what God has said will happen. Do your part today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach. Lord, I know I read a lot. I know we are very deep for a Sunday morning. But God, these people need to know these things for they're the only ones that can delay some of these things. And God, they need to be prepared. Lord, they don't want Jesus. They don't have to have you. But God, they don't need to, to reject you ignorantly. So God, I pray that you speak to hearts today. I pray that you change eternities today to such a degree that God, we might change the history of the United States of America. Lord, you lead us today. You accomplish your will today. And we'll do our best to follow you today. For we ask it in Jesus' name.